more teenagers go to the hospital because they punch a wall. Wow. Wow. So maybe we should have anger management class today <laughs> instead of injury prevention class. <laughs> okay. What else do y'all think common injuries are in teenagers? This class goes by way faster when you answer questions. What's a common injury in teenagers? What do y'all think? How do teenagers hurt themselves? Doing stupid stuff like dares from friends or I don't know, just stupid stuff. I've seen a lot of my friends actually hurt themselves over something really ridiculous. And okay. Go on, like punching a wall, maybe. <laughs> okay. What else? Anybody play sports or do active things? Hugging on air and falling upstairs, definitely. Broken bones, being stupid. Yep, all of the above. Wait. Anything else y'all can think about? Think of? All right. So the top seven are y'all ready for this? It's exciting stuff. Number one is falls. That's the most common cause of injury for kids of all ages. So playgrounds, stairs windows, bathtubs, all the falls. Um, this number two is being struck by or against an object, walking into a wall, punching a wall, being hit by a baseball, um, pulling a TV over on yourself, um, getting hit by in football or soccer or softball. Um, yeah, so getting hit by something. Number three is motor vehicle accidents. So we've talked a little bit about this and safe driving, um, but this is number three. There are millions of motor vehicle accidents every year. Um, and so that impacts a lot of teenagers. Why do you think teenagers have more mur mur murder vehicle? Did y'all hear that? Um, motor vehicle accidents than older drivers. You missed. Because we're stupid. Because you're stupid. Okay, well, I don't think you're stupid, but I think that maybe you are. We do maybe. dumb things. I mean. Yes. You're more likely to take risks, maybe. Um, they're on the phone quite a lot. I'm seeing in the, the um, chat box. Yeah, and I think, too, just... You don't have as much experience. I've been driving for like 15 years, so I figured out some stuff and y'all are still learning. So yeah, all good stuff. All right, so number four is cuts and puncture wounds. What is a way a teenager might get a cut or puncture wound? I know, Miss Jillian, I could crash on my bike. Oh my gosh, that is so good. Yes, absolutely. Who else has an idea for how you could get a scratch or punch, puncture wound? Ooh, playing with PVC pipe and cutting it. Yep, that's, that could be tricky. I don't even know if I wanna know that story, Greg Screws. Don't even, not even sure how I feel about that. Do y'all cook? Yeah, so you're starting to cook, use knives, stuff like that, yeah. Being outside, climbing on stuff, um, all kinds of things can, can um, cause cuts or piercings or punctures. All right, number five is bites and stings. 
why y'all gonna get bitten as a teenager? Your sister says y'all the cats. Oh yeah. If you were inside club this morning, you saw me being attacked by my cat the entire class. So, mm -hmm. yep, feel that. Kicking an anthill or wasp nest. Oh yeah. That does not sound fun. Not good times. Yeah, so um, dogs, cats, animals, horses, um, and then also bugs, like you get bug bites or spider bites or those kinds of things. Um, so the more that we are out in the world or out in nature, um, the more likely we, are, likely we are to have those things happen. Um, and the number six is foreign bodies. This one's a little bit weird. Um, so this article says it's safe to say that every kid experiences a foreign body at some point during their childhood, whether it be a splinter in their finger or a sweet pea in their nose, curious kiddos get things stuck. It, it's the fourth most common reason for an ER trip in kids. So raise your hands if you ever stuck something in your nose or your ear as a kid, like a Lego, I don't know. Hi. Peppermints. Okay, so foreign bodies. So anytime um, that you're choking or a kiddo swallowed a quarter or um, actually had a friend the other day whose daughter shot herself in the finger with a BB and she had to have a BB surgically removed from her finger. That's a foreign body. All kinds of wild and craziness. And then the last one, number seven, is burns. So what's a reason that teenagers might get a burn? Oh, Marvin kiddos. Sarah got a bell up her nose one time. Here you go. So why might you get a burn cookie? Yep, for sure. Are y'all? Say it again. Playing with fire. I've had a few of my friends actually, you know, have a lighter and just keep sticking their finger on it because reasons. Yes. Roasting marshmallows also. Yep, around a campfire. Yep. Girls, anybody got one of these things? What is this? An alligator at the moment. When I was a teenager, I used to iron my hair. True story. With an iron. Put it on the ironing board. Iron my hair because that's how much I wanted straight hair. Um, so wouldn't recommend things like that, for example. Just throwing that out there. Um, but things, yeah, like curling irons and <laughs> straighteners. Um, those kinds of things that y'all are using can cause burns. Um, and then what about sunburns? Do y'all use sunscreen religiously like you always should? Some of you do. Really I'm peeling, so please don't listen to anything that I say right now um, from the beach. So. Sunscreen is another thing. Um, lawn mower mo motors. Oh yeah. Miriam says don't use curlers or straighteners. Go natural. Love it. Um, yeah. So all these are types of burns. Um, another thing you can think about is cold burns. So like frostbite is actually considered a burn. Um, so things like making sure you're bundled up if you're going to be out in the cold. Um, and, and taking care of, of your body, whether you're gonna be in super hot temperatures or super cold temperatures is really important. Um, okay, so those are the top seven. So I want to talk just a little bit about one injury that's kind of close to my heart. Um, so y'all know I talk a lot about mental health, right? Like we've, we've covered physical health stuff, but also I think it's so important to talk about mental health. And for me, there's an injury that I think kind of contributes to both mental and physical health. What are you doing? dancer over here. Um, and so this injury is a concussion. 
Um, has anybody ever had a concussion? Okay, so if you have had a concussion, do you care to share your experience with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was like six, no, I was like seven years old and I was riding my bike and one of my friends like cut right in front of me and I tried to stop really fast and um, my feet went, I was holding onto my handlebars and my feet went this way and I ended up like smacking my head on the curb and um, I think I passed out for like 30 minutes or so, and then um, it, it was a minor concussion. But. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing. Anybody else had a concussion? I don't want to share. Jonathan says he had one, somebody threw something at him. So do y'all remember that day that I was like, I'm not teaching today because I'm in the ER because Charlie had an accident. Um, she actually had a concussion Mom. that day. Yep. I have no idea why. Mama. Yes, Charlie. Yeah. I love you too. Um, so she actually, Carter was pushing her on the swing and she fell backwards and hit her head. And so when she did that, um, she never lost consciousness, but she got really, really sleepy right after. Um, and then she threw up and then she started slurring her words. And I have never, ever, ever in my life been so scared as I was when she was doing that because it just was so scary. Um, and she couldn't like get words out. Like she was trying to tell us things and she just like couldn't. Um, and so it was just the scariest thing. Um, and so, Oh, Charlie, turn the light on. Um, honey, you have to turn the light on. There we go. Um, and so it got me kind of interested in this and the way that concussion affects the brain. So there's things like concussions. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions around concussions. So like, I don't know, I heard, I heard people say like, you shouldn't let people go to sleep if they have a concussion. Well, that's actually um, a myth because your brain has an injury and so you actually want it to rest and heal and so that's something that I didn't really know I was so scared because she was trying to fall asleep and um, and that's that's kind of a myth and then there are lots of other things like um, looking at people who have had repeat concussions so like NFL players or um, sports players who've had like concussion after concussion after concussion. Um, there's actually an increased risk of domestic violence in them and an increased risk of self-harm and suicide. So um, there's a lot of really interesting studies now about brain injuries and the way that, um, you know, one concussion, generally if you can rest and heal from it, doesn't affect you long-term. But people who have had repeated concussions can actually see a lot of damage long-term. Um, so I want to talk about this a little bit because I think, so my husband as a teenager, um, he, was snow, he was like a snowboarder and so he would snowboard all the time. And he got a couple concussions and I don't think we really took it very seriously because he just had a headache and we were kind of like, oh, whatever. Um, and so now that I have a little girl and was like scared to death by her, um, I just want y'all to kind of be aware of concussions and how scary they can be and kind of the impact they can have, especially if you get concussions over and over and over again. So I'm gonna show you a video. Go watch with me. Do you want to watch Llama Llama? Out there, though? Okay. Getting the coke working. Getting the coke working. All right. Okay. Please hold for deodorant ads. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. 
Each year in the United States, players of sports and recreational activities receive between 2.5 and 4 million concussions. How dangerous are all those concussions? The answer is complicated and lies in how the brain responds when something strikes it. The brain is made of soft, fatty tissue with a consistency something like jello. Inside its protective membranes and the skull's hard casing, this delicate organ is usually well shielded. But a sudden jolt can make the brain shift and bump against the skull's hard interior. And unlike jello, the brain's tissue isn't uniform. It's made of a vast network of 90 billion neurons, which relay signals through their long axons to communicate throughout the brain and control our bodies. This spindly structure makes them very fragile so that when impacted, neurons will stretch and even tear. That not only disrupts their ability to communicate, but as destroyed axons begin to degenerate, they also release toxins, causing the death of other neurons too. This combination of events causes a concussion. The damage can manifest in many different ways, including blackout, headache, blurry vision, balance problems, altered mood and behavior, problems with memory, thinking, and sleeping, and the onset of anxiety and depression. Every brain is different, which explains why people's experiences of concussions vary so widely. Luckily, the majority of concussions fully heal and symptoms disappear within a matter of days or weeks. Lots of rest and a gradual return to activity allows the brain to heal itself. On the subject of rest, many people have heard that you're not supposed to sleep shortly after receiving a concussion because you might slip into a coma. That's a myth. So long as doctors aren't concerned there may also be a more severe brain injury, like a brain bleed, there's no documented problem with going to sleep after a concussion. Sometimes, victims of concussion can experience something called post-concussion syndrome, or PCS. People with PCS may experience constant headaches, learning difficulties, and behavioral symptoms that even affect their personal relationships for months or years after the injury. Trying to play through a concussion, even for only a few minutes, or returning to sports too soon after a concussion makes it more likely to develop PCS. In some cases, a concussion can be hard to diagnose because the symptoms unfold slowly over time. That's often true of subconcussive impacts, which result from lower impact jolts to the head than those that cause concussions. This category of injury doesn't cause noticeable symptoms right away, but can lead to severe degenerative brain diseases over time, if it happens repeatedly. Take soccer players who are known for repeatedly heading soccer balls. Using a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, we're beginning to find out what effect that has on the brain. This method allows scientists to find large axon bundles and see how milder blows might alter them structurally. In 2013, researchers using this technique discovered that athletes who had headed the ball the most, about 1,800 times a year, had damaged the structural integrity of their axon bundles. The damage was similar to how a rope will fail when the individual fibers start to fray. Those players also performed worse on short-term memory tests. So even though no one suffered full-blown concussions, these sub-concussive hits added up to measurable damage over time. In fact, researchers know that an overload of subconcussive hits is linked to a degenerative brain disease known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. 
People with CTE suffer from changes in their mood and behavior that begin appearing in their 30s or 40s, followed by problems with thinking and memory that can, in some cases, even result in dementia. The culprit is a protein called tau. Usually, tau proteins support tiny tubes inside our axons, called microtubules. It's thought that repeated subconcussive hits damage the microtubules, causing the tau proteins to dislodge and clump together. The clumps disrupt transport and communication along the neuron and drive the breakdown of connections within the brain. Once the tau proteins start clumping together, they cause more clumps to form and continue to spread throughout the brain even after head impacts have stopped. The data show that at least among football players, between 50 and 80% of concussions go unreported and untreated. Sometimes that's because it's hard to tell a concussion has occurred in the first place. But it's also often due to pressure or a desire to keep going despite the fact that something's wrong. This doesn't just undermine recovery, it's also dangerous. Our brains aren't invincible. They still need us to shield them from harm and help them undo damage once it's been done. All right, so what'd y'all think about that? Dub Advanced Care's new formula enriched. Anybody else have thoughts on that video? Y'all learn anything? Yeah, I think it's really good. Yeah, I think that it's really good. I think 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 it's really repeated concussions can actually have their personality changed or really have impacts to their mental health as well. And so the biggest thing that I always want y'all to take away um, is just that it's okay if you're struggling. So like if you have something happen to you, it's okay to, to stop and be like, I can't play today or I can't do this today. Um, and not to feel that pressure because feeling that peer pressure in the moment to continue playing could actually be detrimental for the rest of your life. So always just kind of hold that in mind. Um, and I have one more video I'm going to show you. If I can find it. More teens and young children are competing in sport. Okay, hold on. Sorry, my computer is so slow. Okay. All right. So this is just some tips on preventing injuries that I hope are helpful for y'all. More teens and young children are competing in sports than ever before, but all sports have a potential for injury, and athletes who are still growing are especially at risk for injury because growing bones are not able to withstand the same stress as adult bones.
overuse of a muscle, ligament, or tendon is the cause of about half of all sports injuries in children. The risk for injury from contact sports increases when players of different sizes play together. Young children, especially those eight and under, are less Today. I'm sure this lady would appreciate being frozen like this. <laughs> we are so sorry about that. But all sports have a potential for injury, and athletes who are still growing are especially at risk for injury because growing bones are not able to withstand the same stress as adult bones. Overuse of a muscle, ligament, or tendon is the cause of about half of all sports injuries in children. The risk for injury from contact sports increases when players of different sizes play together. Young children, especially those eight and under, are less coordinated and have slower reaction times than adults. Young athletes also don't judge injury risks as well as adults. Here are guidelines to help reduce the risks of sports injuries. Choose a sport that is age appropriate for your child's size and maturity. Use the right equipment and safety gear in the proper size for your child. Choose a sport that's supervised by qualified adults in leagues that are committed to safety. And restrict play to appropriate, well-maintained surfaces. Also, make sure your child is prepared to play. You wouldn't send a child who can't swim into a pool. So make sure your child knows how to play the sport before going onto the field. You can guard against overuse injuries by having your child try a variety of activities. Avoid overtraining in one sport or playing multiple sports in the same season and take at least one day off every week to allow your child's body to recover. Remember to seek medical help for a traumatic injury or an overuse injury when pain persists. And lastly, avoid re-injury by having your child rest until an injury is completely healed. While sports injuries aren't completely preventable, you can still help your child stay in the game by being proactive about safety. All right, what y'all think about that video? Did you learn anything? So I sprained my ankle last year and I had to keep dancing on it. Um, I got like maybe a week off. And so when I do certain things, it still hurts. So make sure you heal before you start doing your thing again. Yeah, for sure. Don't throw your kid in the pool to teach him how to swim. Also good, good advice. Yep. Um, I think about my Carter because he's a pitcher 
And so like on Saturday or Sunday, I can't remember, he threw like 115 pitches or something. And so thinking about things like that, like we really have to make sure that, which his coach is really good about that, about like we only practice a couple days a week, so he gets a break. But um, Tanner's little brother's the same way. And so they're throwing a lot and lot of, of lots of, of baseballs and so we got to make sure we take care of those shoulders and those arms because they're they're just 10 years old and so we don't want to injure them um for their whole lives because they're they're playing baseball now so awesome okay um any questions about any of this did you learn something today So the last thing that I have for you, um, who is going trick or treating or going out on Halloween, even with younger siblings or um, anybody? Some of you are, okay. So the last video that I have for you, hi Alicia. Um, so the last video that I have for you is about Halloween safety. Um, and so I'm not just gonna share about um, trick-or-treating or Halloween stuff, but um, this is specifically about pumpkin carving. So do you all carve pumpkins with your families? Anybody? Some of you? Okay. So I figure even if you don't carve pumpkins, this may be something that you can use later, um, later as well. So we're gonna watch us a pumpkin carving video. Yeah, I'm not very good at it either, but I try. Hello, Dr. Safety here with my buddy Jack to talk to you about pumpkin carving safety tips. Every year, people like yourself may get injured carving a pumpkin. I know it sounds crazy, but some people get poked in the eye, stabbed in the hand, or even, even cut their finger. A lot of these people end up needing to see someone like myself, a hand surgeon, who will have to repair their tendon or nerve because of their pumpkin carving mishap. So hopefully these safety tips will keep you and your family safe this Halloween. The first thing to do is pretty simple. Get a pair of safety glasses. They're good if you're having a party or you're helping a young one who may be wielding a knife or one of the safety knives um, so that you don't get poked in the eye. You don't wanna be the one person after Halloween still wearing an eye patch. The second thing, dry off your pumpkin, your hands, and whatever instruments you're using. Uh, wet hands are easy to slip, a surefire way to get a cut. Now, the most important thing, use the right tools for the job. Back in the day, we used knives like these. They are not the tools to be used today. And just to clarify, the small knives are no safer. These types of knives, the safety knives, do two things. One, they can't poke you, they can't cut you, but they cut through a pumpkin better than the old knives. So they are great to use. And for little kids, they make ones for small hands as well. For those of you who like power tools, battery operated, still just as safe, can't cut your hand, can't stab your hand, and they go through the pumpkin like water. So why do we make a big deal about using these kind of knives? Well, here's why. We've seen a lot of people get injured and it's the same two mechanisms. If they're holding the pumpkin to try to carve the top, the knife slips and they slice right through the thumb region. The other way, they're holding the pumpkin, they're cutting out the eye, it goes all the way through the pumpkin, stabs their hand on the other side. So if you wear those two things, that's about 95% of the injuries. Now what happens if you do cut your hand? First of all, don't panic. Apply pressure, Elevate your hand and wait about five minutes. After you've waited, check your finger. It's probably stopped bleeding. 
run it under some water to clean it off, ointment and a band-aid. Now, how do you know if you need to go to the emergency room or to an urgent care? Well, if the cut goes all the way across or you can see anything sticking out, you need to go in to get some stitches. What about if your hand is numb after you cut yourself or you can't move the finger? Unfortunately, another trip to the emergency department or urgent care is in your future. Now, if you did cut something, you may end up needing to see someone like myself, a hand specialist, for surgery. But hopefully, if you follow these safety tips, that won't happen. Well, from Jack and I, thanks for your attention. Hopefully, you and your family have a safe and happy Halloween. All right, so I hope you all have um, a good week one. and don't stab yourself carving your pumpkin this weekend. Um, um, and I'm stay safe. Really so if y'all have any questions or need anything, just yell at me and I will see y'all next week. I want the pumpkin. I want this one.